All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today, I have a very special guest here on the channel. This is Ted with Ted's Holdover. Now, I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard of his content or the type of stuff that he does, but I wanted to have him on the channel here because he's an awesome dude, and he's also an innovator in the airgun world in terms of some of these really clever ways that he films some of his hunting content. So, Ted, thanks for hanging out with me today, man. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, we got to know each other yesterday, and yeah. I feel very comfortable with you now. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that, man. You, you're kind of a legend in the air gun world. You've you got one of the largest air gun channels on YouTube, don't you? Yeah, I definitely have a big one. Uh, a lot of that, I think, is because I came out of the gate early, but uh, I like that's to think right. that some of it is my own charming personality. So, so you and I have been at it a while? Yeah, uh, yeah, you're, and you're even old school to me, so how long you've been around. So. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> okay. So you were telling me yesterday, that when you got started with this stuff. So in case you guys don't know, definitely check out Ted's Holdover. Go subscribe to his channel right now. You're going to love it. This guy has some amazing kills that he, I mean, these, these kills that he films are crazy, but it wasn't always so polished, was it? It started <laughs> no. out kind of crude in the early. So what made you want to start doing this, man? Well. Filming the, the, the style that you film. All right. The short way of this is that I was trying to teach some Boy Scouts how to shoot at the range with 22 long rifles, and they couldn't wrap their brain around why when they play Call of Duty, they can just hold the crosshairs on regardless of, <laughs> of how far away <laughs> the dark. So they come to the range and they don't understand why they're having a four or five inch drop at 100 yards when they're zeroed at, at 20 or 30. And I found that it was very difficult to film through those guns or even try to film it going down range. And by, able, by shooting these air rifles, which have no recoil, and pointing a camera down there, I was able to show them how the wind can push and drift. And, and so the, the urgency that I had was simply to point a cheap point and shoot camera in the very beginning days and just put it aiming down the scope so that these, these kids could see that this is not a vacuum, you know, that things are getting shoved and pushed yeah. around and they have to, they have to adapt for, for the conditions. Yeah, and projectiles are not laser beams. They don't go in a <laughs> yeah. straight line forever. If they were, you'd get one zero and that'd be it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You know, so as a training aid to help the to help these young people understand, you know, uh, external ballistics. You know what bullets do when they leave barrels. I mean, uh, you guys know when you zero a gun, obviously gravity takes over. Projectile leaves a barrel, and it's on a journey to the ground immediately. <laughs> and uh, of course, we have various calculations that we come up with to figure out, you know, at what rate the projectile falls, at what rate the projectile pushes. Uh, it gets pushed around by the wind and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that is a great way to demonstrate those concepts. And you started shooting these pigeons and little critters. Oh, yes. And so. you started putting this <laughs> up on YouTube, right? So, so tell me about like the first video you put up that you were like, okay, we might be on to something here. If it was one where all I did was have my cheap little Panasonic $200 point and shoot camera down the middle. <laughs> As at my, my farm where I grew up, and I, just, I was just being a wing nut that day, just having a bit of fun screwballing around. And when I got home, I realized the footage was actually pretty good. All I did was upload it. There was no me talking. There was no fine polishing, no editing. It was just a video that I put on YouTube. And the next thing I know, the sucker is rocketing to three, four, five, eight million views. Wow. And it just, in early YouTube days, when things caught fire, there was no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah. So uh, all of a sudden, YouTube says, you know, in so many words, do you want to start a channel? I didn't even thought about it. And then they give you the, the do you want to join the partner program and, and, yeah. be, and be a part of things? I'm like, all right, yeah, let's go. Let's see what happens. And uh, so I stumbled into all of this, just trying to teach a small group of Boy Scouts about ballistics. <laughs> That's amazing, dude. Yeah. <laughs> that is so awesome. So tell me a little bit about some of your early gear. So when you first started out, you mentioned like maybe some of your gear was really crude. One of the things that he and I were talking about earlier in the day today was that when he first started doing this, there was no such thing as these tacticams and scope cams and all of these more official and polished type of uh, you know mechanism you can use to film your down the bore shots, down the scope shots. You were having to kind of improvise and adapt, so you sort of innovated what what we now take for granted as this type of technology. So how'd you get started? What what'd you use early on? Yeah, that's a good point. There was no demand. The only demand was me. I, that was my <laughs> demand. So then I, you do it, and then other people catch on. That looks pretty interesting. They see how it can be a useful learning tool. But in short, to answer your question, just simply taking whatever you have that you take pictures of your kids at their birthday party with, 
30 frames per second, 720p, you know? <laughs> and you just get it the best you can, either by stacking something on your block or, or you know, twisting or turning or whatever, and then, and then just trying to get as best you can, pointing down the scope. And I would buy cameras based on the lens placement of the cameras, you know, because you, you get a feeling like, that'll be pretty close if I can get that one. So, uh, yeah, for, for two years, it was just cheap, Point and shoot Panasonic. So you were looking through the viewfinder. Yeah, the that's a bear. That can be tough. And yeah. that's tough. Yeah. I like polarized sunglasses like a lot of guys do. And you have polarized sunglasses and all of a sudden everything just disappears on, that's right. on, on LCD. So so um, you're doing this back and forth and, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, it was you made do and everything was a jerry rig. Every it was, it was rubber bands and zip ties. You know, that's what everyone was using until, you know, as you said, the It fans. ain't dumb if it works, right? It worked. So what air guns were you shooting? Uh, back then uh, that was now I, I'm not a Springer fan, and those recoil like something nasty. So I don't I don't have much to say about spring guns. A lot of other guys do. Look to them for that information. I shot precharged automatic. My first one was a Benjamin Marauder, $500 gun, something like that, non-regulated, 30 shots about on a fill, something like that. And then then I got this crazy idea that you know a, a modest price gun wasn't going to do it. I needed something exotic. So I am one of the first in the U.S. to go to the Russian market. <laughs> I get a, I, I spend an amount of money, $1,600 on a pre-charged automatic Russian single shot bullpup air rifle. My wife, that was, I mean, she thought I was literally insane then. She, I mean, I could see her, she looks at you like, I still love you, but... <laughs> I don't know about you anymore, you know? It was, it was $1,600, um, but I was the first one, to, not one, not the first one, probably one of the first hundred in the States to get one. Probably and one of the first people to film with it and, oh, and absolutely. Yeah, use yeah. it in that yeah. capacity. The, 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 this little culture of air gunning had always been there, but it always was flying under the radar, and it wasn't until we took these things out, started filming through the scopes, where the, the hobby really took off. That's right. But, but back then, $1,600, uh, so to return to that story, 1600 bucks, and I um, was the first one to get one, one of the first ones. People want to know more about the gun. I'm like the forums and stuff, the bullshit and the chatting with your buddies. They yeah. want to know more about this gun. So I just named my channel Ed Gun, which is Ed Gun is the guy who makes it. I got him Ed in Russia, makes a gun, and calls it an Ed Gun. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> very simple marketing. Yeah, very direct and simple. <laughs> so at what point um, did you end up getting with Frederick and starting to work with FX? I mean, like, I know this is this has been pretty much the culmination of everything you want in Air Gun, isn't it? It is. This is your baby now. This like, is. Right? So Frederick and FX Air Guns, I was not on their radar. Uh, they were Swedish guns, and they I wanted a bullpup. They hadn't made one then, so I, I wasn't even thinking about that. Then Frederick saw value in what I was doing. He sends me a gun, which was the FX Royal 400, kind of his flagship back then. And uh, when I realized- And what in, year was this? 2011. I met Frederick- So it's at, been a minute. Yeah, 2000, I started this all up in 2009, 2010. Met Frederick in 2011 at the first major competition in the US. He's a genius. He is a absolute, and I'm, oh, if he's watching this, I'm not, I don't he's, want to say he's, <laughs> he, he, ner he nerds out in all the good ways, for sure. He, they, he, oh, he's always said, my favorite air gun is the one I haven't made yet. That's, as soon as he makes it, and as soon as it's perfected, he just like, gives it out of here, go sell it, because I got things to invent now. That's right. Yeah. Wow. I mean, if you, you can't promote yourself until you can replace yourself. <laughs> so it's like, if, if you can't work on the next yeah. best thing until you, you know, move on, along with life. So you've got the, this is the Wildcat Mark III. This one's a 22. This is a 22, yep. Right. So you prefer this to the Impact, don't I you? I would give this up last out of my entire collection. If you said I could keep one, and even though this is less expensive, less powerful, uh, some people say less accurate, that's only because the Impacts are, you get the idea. They're big, long guns. Yeah. Um, this, this gun is the one I reach for 95% of the time. When I, when I want a gun and there's something out there that I don't want to be living anymore, this is the thing I grab <laughs> instantly. I can stock with it. Yeah, I can give a million reasons. I won't get into all of them. But in short, this is my favorite. Everybody's talking about the impact, the FX impact. The, your viewers have probably seen it leaking into their feed here and there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but no, this is my favorite. Favorite. Well, wow. by far. So this one's moderated. Go over a few of the specs uh, for people that may not be associated with this particular gun. Okay, well, talk about, you know, yeah. let's talk about your rig a little bit. It's a 300cc bottle up front, mini bottle, 500 millimeter barrel. Everything is nice and tidy. Nothing is reaching out very far. Um, a big 
thing that they did this, a big improvement from the, from the Wildcat Mark III, this is the BT, which stands for bottle, right? So they have a plenum here, and the plenum is the little section of air after the regulator that your gun can use as an energy source. So it, the regulator, this is much higher pressure, goes through the regulator, so now this is all the same pressure here in the plenum, and this is the energy source that it uses each time. Now the bigger that is, the bigger the energy source. So they made that bigger on this gun, which gives me more power, so I am shooting a 23 grain, 22 hollow point slug at 1,000 feet per second without stressing the gun out at all. So these shots that you're taking on, especially like these pigeons and yeah. some of these small critters and things, you're shooting probably what, 80, 100 yards or so at most? That's not at most. That's, that's like the, the max comfort level on like a windy day. Wind, cro wind croaks off. No, we're out to 150, no problem. Really? Yeah, yeah. So, all right, so what's the longest shot you've, you've recorded yourself taking the longest, with, with this gun? With this gun, I have uh, 130 yard, 140 yard. That's a long way for that little 20, you said 24 grain pellet? 23, yeah. 23, <laughs> wow. That's a light little pellet. I mean, that wind can really push that thing around like crazy. So yes. it has to be a real calm day to take, to be confident and take a shot like Out that. Out to that far, or at least a consistent day. If the wind is a steady 10, I, oh, that's fine. It, no big deal. I can, I can gauge that if it's gusting and blowing and swirling. Well, the nice the, thing about this being moderated, though, is that they don't really associate with danger. If you miss, you can just shoot again, right? You, absolutely. You'll put so, it right by their head and... They go on with their life. <laughs> they give you another one. I have multiple times on camera where I've shot and it has gone past their head so close it could have taken like electrons off of their skin. <laughs> and they just sit there and they give you another shot. And then of course, because you got to see it, because um, you know, we'll, we'll put some high visibility here on the back of the slug like that. So when you shoot it, not only can I film it with high visibility, I can actually see it traveling down range. So you're spotting your own shot. I, they, I, if because they haven't moved, I spot my own shots. I know exactly how to make my adjustment on the next shot. On the next That's shot, right. then, yeah. So I want to mention something too, because I'm sure that with all the hunting type content, you probably get a lot of haters. So like, oh, why are you shooting these pigeons and all? Explain to people just to put their mind at ease, and make them understand they're nuisance, right? They're pests. Yeah. They, they they get into what the grain silos. I mean, what is what is the the main nuisance purpose like? What do these birds do that makes them such a bad nuisance? They carry certain um, protozoan and bacterial and viral infections that they will defecate on the animal's feet. We, it is quantifiable how much they can hurt our farming business. It is, isn't like a, we're just guessing. We can actually right. see our numbers improve when we shoot a lot of these birds. So namely, they are competing for the food. They'll come down and eat the best bits out of the silage. You know, all the best pieces of kernel and whatnot. Sure. They, they, they sort through it and grab the best, most protein-packed, nutritious pieces. And your animals need that. That's right. Those right. are for our animals. So everything that they eat, the animals don't eat. And on top of that, then they defecate in the food, and our animals are eating that defecation, which can make them quite ill. So the same way that we would kill, uh, you know, a hog or a coyote who's being a nuisance, yeah. uh, these pigeons are essentially a nuisance uh, in, these, in these farm environments. And uh, so you grew up on a farm, right? You oh, yeah. grew up farming. So this is something that's completely normal that you, you know through all these years. This is something you've been doing your entire life. You just decide to start filming it and putting it on YouTube. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, and, and, the, and the filming bit, like I said, was stumbled into. But I was blasting these birds since I was, you know, eight years old with, a, with my Marlin 60 in my hand. You know? That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yep. All right, so you've gone a long way from just taping and, and jerry-rigging something back here with some rubber bands. Yep. Talk a little bit about your, your recording setup you're using now. All right, so now we... Where the rubber meets the road. Here. Yes, <laughs> there's, there's two basic ways, and we have two different setups here. And, uh, and they're both held on to the ocular piece by uh, a collar. What would, you, what would you call that? I forget, like a compression okay. collar. Yeah, like yeah. a collet? Yeah. And that slides over there. Oh, uh, look at that. So that loosens up. So you can Come a long it. way from rubber bands. <laughs> <laughs> rubber, rubber bands and zip ties. And then you just have this, and it just bites on that, and that's it. And uh, this is a GoPro version. Um, so wow. this one uh, can record, this is a two-way splitter mirror. This is like your, your two-way glass. And this one sends 75% of the light to the camera, 25% to my eye. So this is a new kind of a new way of thinking about this. Tory Pines was one of the first ones to do this. He did it with a GoPro and it cost a fortune. They have come down considered. That was like a $1,200 for that rig. Tory Pines, they were the people who <laughs> made those little bitty thermals, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Little thermal cameras. He had, very, he had a whole bunch of gear that was very like, 
like uh, he was like the avant garde of the gun community. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. He's doing, kind of a niche thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's cool. Um, and then the other way, so this is sending some light to the GoPro and sending some light to my eye. So when I can actually still use um, my actual eye, take the shot, as opposed to something like this where you're using uh, a viewfind screen and you're actually I using see. the screen itself to shoot. So this is sort of a homogenization of the technology you started out with. Yeah. Essentially where the camera just goes directly behind the scope, you're looking at the viewfinder, the, basically, the camera, it, you're, you're looking at a digital representation of the reality of, of what the scope's looking at. That's right. And that's how ther a lot of thermals work. You know, because is. when you're looking at a thermal, you're looking at a screen that is giving you an input from what the thermal is seeing. Like, it's giving you a digital representation of what the thermal's seeing. So this is kind of cool because it's, it's your eye, it's the light coming through, you're looking through the scope, yep. and, and you get to sort of just keep shooting and not have to worry about the camera being yeah. an integral part of the gun. You get to just treat the gun like a gun and then the recording doing its thing. That said. It's very smart. Um, if, you have so if you have bad vision though, you can, this, can leave, this can go quite wrong for you. So if you needed uh, glasses, right? But you don't use your glasses when you shoot because lucky for you, you got the, the ocular piece here on the end. So you can adjust this for your crappy vision, right? Mm -hmm. But if you adjust this for your crappy vision, now, this is looking through your crappy glasses, essentially. Oh, so wow. you get what I'm saying? If you yeah. skew this so it's no longer focused, it's focusing in your eye, and your eye is imperfect, but this is perfect. Wow. So you're sending an imperfect image now to this. So if you're going to use something like this, you have gotta use your glasses too when you shoot so that your vision's sure. perfect so you don't muck it up. That is where this doesn't have that problem. I see, so you've got, you've got the direct behind cyber yep. shot, yep. you've got the you know, the one that uses the GoPro, yep. and those are recording the reticle, and then this camera is simply just looking back at you. So yeah, the, this the, is, per, yeah, the perspective right. of the shooter. That's, this is those cameras. Gotcha, is, yeah. okay. So I, I like to keep it all in, if, I, if I'm all camera ready on my gun, I'm not picking up tripods, walking around, it's wasting a lot of time. I can move quickly from place yeah. to place. I, in, in three hours, I can kill a lot of things on the farm. Whereas if I'm trying to set up too many shots like this, while that's great to show the viewers what we're doing, it stymies your ability to kill as much as you want to, you know, kill as many of these animals, these pests as you want. And that's why you like this light. That gun. is why you I can like move fast, you can get where you need to go. It's all there. Keep it light, keep it short, keep it compact. I keep a, uh, a battery pack here on the side. Right here, so oh, I see. so uh, I put I keep that on the side, and the reason why I keep it there is because I was missing shots. So the, the issue with all this all the time, Eric, is that you're always <laughs> you're ready. The bird's right there. You can pick it up and shoot him in two seconds, but to set it all up takes twelve seconds, right? So I want to cut that time down as much as possible. If you have to turn the camera on and then get the shutter going, that is seconds I don't want to waste. So I That's keep. Right the bank on here, keep everything on all day long. So then it's just shutter and off I go. It, it's just a way of getting more on film. That is the biggest frustration of something when, when, uh, when you have this kind of, when you start to have this mentality like, it didn't happen if it's not on camera. And that can kind of erode the fun out of it. So I, when you're missing shots because you're using cameras, it can chip away at your fun for that day. And yep. my goal is to keep this as fun as possible. <laughs> and, you want, and you want to be an effective hunter, too. You don't want to wound birds. No, I mean, even though they are a nuisance and you're trying to take them out, you matter. don't want to wound them. You want no. to make sure it, it's humane as possible. So that makes sense. And plus, you're trying to record this stuff. So, the, so you're basically taking the element of the cameraman out of it and leaving everything on and having your onboard power and everything. So I guess the only thing we didn't talk about is the helix. Let's talk about the optic. So you and Matt Dubber oh, yeah. and a few other guys, like y'all have been very instrumental in helping develop these optics and everything. Yes, when they, it, it, it was a bit daunting actually to be, to, be, to tell for having, you know, I, I know what I like and I know what works for me, absolutely. But to have the confidence of a company investing that kind of money into, a, into a, an upstart company and, and they say, we want you to design these reticles. Um, you know, you, you go to the various shots, so you see the, the, the SM, the Schmitten vendors, and then you look through these amazing March scopes, and the, the, the reticles look like they're made by evil geniuses, right? <laughs> they just, it's just, you look at them, you're just flabbergasted. How do I, where do I start? How to use this? There's so many tools in it. And in short, they asked me, when they asked me to design a reticle, I thought, I can't do this, I can't, but they said that we don't want that. We want a reticle 
that makes sense for you. So when you're teaching someone, it makes sense for them. So they asked me to design it, and I designed it in what I called the EHR expedited hold reticle, a fancy way of saying get your ass on target as fast as possible. <laughs> right? <laughs> So I know that you, you shoot a lot of like the pigeons and stuff. What are some of the other critters? Have, have you shot like rabbits and ground squirrels and oh, that, all types yeah. of other critters as well in, in addition to pigeons? Because I'll be honest, like most of the videos of yours that I've seen, I've, I've seen the, the pigeon shots. The birdies. That's yeah. kind of what you're known for, those bird shots, yeah, right? But, absolutely. But you've done a lot of other pest eradication too. Yes. And, and to be clear, I, I own firearms too. I am a, I'm a red-blooded American with a three gun safe, just like the rest of us, right? That's right. <laughs> um, so I absolutely, I do, I do my deer hunting and stuff, but um, other people do that quite well and I leave that to them. That's right. And, and I focus on this, but yes, I, I um, when it comes to like other kinds of hunting, I've taken anything up to the size of coyotes. We will anchor coyotes with these things. Really? In urban environments. In, have you filmed any coyote kills? I filmed them, and, and YouTube didn't much care for oh, them. No. <laughs> so I had to Dude. rip them down right away, oh, um, both man. with night vision and even during the day. We'll put, you know, you put out a, 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 a lure and, uh, and you put out your Fox Pro, yeah. and they just aren't ready for anything that's a threat in an urban environment. They stroll into suburbia, and they think it's, it's all fine and dandy, and then you literally open your bedroom window, remove the screen, <laughs> lay on your bed, and kill a coyote 50 yards out your back window. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it is challenging to get them to come in during the day because I, I, it seems like with all the coyote hunting that there's a heck of a lot of people that, you know, the thermal stuff is a lot of fun. I love hunting with thermals, but everybody does that. Yeah. And it is much harder to film them during the day. I mean, they don't call them wily coyotes for nothing. <laughs> So would you take a coyote with this thing? Not this Probably one. the impact. The impact, yeah. yeah. So I wouldn't take it with this. I want, you know, I want at least 50 foot pounds on exactly where I put it on a coyote. So I would sure. prefer 100, you know, I, I, I don't, that said, I've never had one yipe and run. I've, they've all anchored. Shot and, placement though. Yeah, is, it's is all key. shot placement, yeah. So yeah. I'm not, when it comes to something of that nature that needs a really precise shot, you're not gonna see me reaching out to 160, 150. Yeah. I want 50 yards and in. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring, I got a quiet gun. They're not expecting it. There's no reason why I can't just get them a little closer. Well, we were talking earlier about the video that David and I made because of the Pesca where, you know, he did the, the cranium shot on the doe yeah. with the uh, impact. And I mean, that's it did, a deer. It works. It's, it's, it's in the bag. Now, granted, yeah. she was only like 15 yards away. It was close. Yeah. It was like really close. So, again, it's all shot placement. It's all the capabilities of the gun within the range. And, you know, it, it's cool that these, that these guns can do such a variety of different things. You know, they're incredibly accurate, too. That's one thing I've always loved about yeah, the FXs. They're very accurate. All the adjustability. I mean, earlier, Matt was messing around with the trigger on his impact and just getting every little thing adjusted right. And... Uh, these are definitely the Cadillacs of air guns. I tried, and I need to make a case here to, to your viewers, because I know what your viewers are thinking. They're thinking, why on earth? This is a $1,600 gun right here that's in front of you guys. This is $1,600. And you think to yourself, why would I buy that when I can buy, and you're gonna put, I'm putting my quotes up here, a real gun. And I get it, I get it. A 1022 costs, you know, 300 bucks. Off you go. Um, I would say this. You're getting surgery, all right? And the doctor can spend easily $15 on a, on a Bowie knife, or he could spend <laughs> $500 on a scalpel. Which one do you want him to have doing your search? This is a, is a performance, this is a, a air gun scalpel. This, is, this allows me to quietly do things that a firearm will not allow me to do. So you get some guys in the AirRaffle community who are wanting to drive in things faster, bigger, more powerful. I'm not that guy. I am the guy who grabs his firearms for a situation that needs firearms. But there are many scenarios where a firearm ain't gonna work. And you that know, is why I like these. I think too, it's also the regimen of it. Like I compare this type of air gun shooting compared to guns to like fly fishing. You know, yeah. a fly fisherman flies his tie, or he uh, ties his, his flies up. You know, you can tie your own flies. You know, it's more of the, it's more about the process of it. That's a good way. The, to, the ritual. Really good analogy. Right, it's yeah. a ritual you know, to go through and, and, and take care of every little thing. So I think it, it's just a different different vibe. 
You yeah. know, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but but air gunning is kind of like the fly fishing of hunting, especially when you're you know doing it in this manner. I the I get along really well at the range with the muzzle loader guys. Yeah, right? yeah, that kind of thing. Because yeah. the ritual. Yeah, right. Right. It's yeah. A, well, and maybe that's even a better comparison, right? And that when we look at the gun world. People that shoot black powder, it seems like they're they're kind of in their own little little niche. Yeah. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. I personally, I love black powder. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've I've got a Pedersoli Whitworth, and it's just such a great gun, and it's so accurate, and it takes forever to load. Yeah. But you know what? <laughs> it's satisfying when you pull yeah, that trigger. Uh, yeah. You squeeze the trigger, <laughs> yeah. and the round hits where you want, and all that work was worth it. Yeah. And that's kind of when you look at pre-charged pneumatics. Um, Compared to the way air guns were when we were kids growing up, I mean, you might have had like one, one of pumpers. those pump masters yeah, yeah. or like, you know, a Red Rider or, you know, some type of basic pump gun that maybe not quite as consistent, but there's still that ritual. Yeah. There's still the ritual you, of, all right, got to get eight pumps, got to get 10 pumps. Let me try that. You it know? definitely made you appreciate your shot a lot more because you just yeah. got done earning it. That's right. So when you took, you got one. You got you one shot. You had to pump that sucker up yeah. 10 times. You're 40 seconds in between. Yeah, that's right. So when you, <laughs> so it taught you trigger control and taught you to appreciate the one shot, one kill kind of mentality. Yep. yep. So I guess one thing that I, I would just want to kind of leave our viewers with and, and everything like that. Um, what do you think the future is like for this type of stuff? I mean, obviously Frederick is like mad scientist level awesome when it comes to these things. Do you, do you think that air guns like these are going to get more powerful, more capable, um, quieter, you know, more precise? I mean, is it possible to, to, to exceed this expectation for you? Is there a better air gun than this that Frederick can make? Uh, is there a more accurate gun? Uh, he can give me more shots per fill, you know, stuff like that. Sure. Um, we're filling these things. To give people an idea of what a precharge is, you know, the pumper that you did, you basically filled the air reservoir, you took your one shot and dumped the air reservoir. Right. What these are doing is like, imagine you pumped it instead of 10 times, a thousand times. And then you got to just keep cocking the gun and shooting it over and over. That, that's essentially what a precharged pneumatic air rifle is. Right. So as far as where we go from here, a lot of guys, you're you're at this, this question used to be a broader question that we could all answer. Now we, we all have our own little, this, this hobby's gotten big enough. Now we're, we're branching off into niches in the hobby itself. That's and, right. And my angle is always, I want better precision and higher shot count. The power, to be honest with you, I don't see a point of shooting a pre automatic air rifle faster than speed of sound because now you lose your stealth. And that's a huge part of the appeal. We do not need... Um, permits for our sound suppressors on these. We can keep everything nice and quiet. We're under the radar right now as far as, you know, the, the what is it, the, the big three tobacco yeah, the fire. Legalities. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, if you're asking me where I would take the hobby, it would be more precision, more shots, better prices, people getting into it, and then the biggest, but this is the most important. I can't stress this enough. Compressors are the limiting factor right now when you come to this. That's where everyone hits the brakes. They'll look at this like, wow, you can shoot that that accurately? That's fantastic. And, like, and the scope, yeah, I'm on board. And then you, and because basically once you buy it, you shoot it for free after that. You know, these, yeah. the, the, our ammo costs, not, it's 500 of them for $18. Yeah. It's free to shoot an air rifle. Yep. So they, uh, the, the, where they always hit the brakes is the compressor. How do you get, you know, 4,200 PSI air pressure, and then you go to scuba shops, that's a pain in the butt. They need to make a small compressor that anybody can take with them, and they have done that now. So that exists for about $500, and now the, what used to be the compressor and the tank, this is like a $3,000 investment you had to do. Now for 500 bucks, I can fill this gun as often as I want. That I, makes sense. Yep. I mean, there, there is sort of a prepper element to air guns when you think about, you know, as long as, let's say, for, for the situation that we're dealing with here, you're shooting, shooting skirted pellets. Yep. But if you're shooting solids, you could easily get a bullet mold and just cast your own solids. And you, as long as you have a decent supply of lead, you can cast all the solids you want. And then, of course, as long as you have a compressor, I mean, many people have solar panels. You can just run them off the yep. grid if you want. So there's a lot of flexibility there in being able to have a, a gun that is pretty self-sufficient. You don't have to go to the gun store and buy ammo for it. You can make it yourself, yeah. which is kind of cool. Or because of the cost, you can just, you know, have quite a bit of it on hand. You're right. You need electricity. That's that's what you need. And that's, that's right. It's actually kind of, I love the idea of laying out a mat in the sun 
and thinking that the sun's energy is going into this and that energy is going into this and this and that. And mm -hmm. eventually it's going to put energy on an animal 100 yards down there. It's, a, it's just a really cool way to think yeah. about the, the hobby. The sun yeah. is shooting the yes, animal yeah. in a way, the isn't it? The sun's <laughs> energy. The sun's energy is what's killing that animal yeah. after it goes through a few different ways of, you know, I love, I love that element of this hobby. Yeah. The, the, and of course, I can go out and shoot 500 rounds for $15. My shoulder is not sore one bit. And I just got a ton of trigger time for almost no money at the range. So once it's a buy once, cry once scenario, you buy it and it's just, oh, you'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll pine over it forever. That's all this money I spent, but once you have it, then you shoot it for nothing as long. Yeah, I remember yeah. the first airgun videos we did. And at first I was a little bit skeptical of doing airgun videos. But after a while, I realized like the community, this community is such an awesome community of people. Like they're all very precise and they're very exacting and they really like their data and they really like to crunch the numbers and just and chase that, that little bit of extra accuracy every time, you know? And I, I can appreciate that about the air gun community. It really does remind me of the black powder community. Yeah, very much the so. black powder yeah. guys, you know, they're gonna measure every little charge and yep. take their time and use a drop tube yep. and they're gonna seat the bullet using a very precise regimen yeah. every yeah. single time with the same amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. It's like developing a, a uh, ritual for doing it ensures that it's consistent and that you can repeat the result over and over and over again. We are absolute physics geeks, all of us, big time when it comes to these. So imagine like the Reloader boys, uh, they will spend hours um, testing and retrying different, different loads, different, different powders, um, you know, different temperatures, different primers, different everything. We have all that here out at the range. So we are essentially doing reloading experiments. I can flip a lever on this and change my power right there. That, has, that impacts how hard the hammer hits the valving. Then I can change how much pressure's in my, you know, the regular, you can change everything about this. This is a reloading platform for people who like reloading and geeking out. That can be done at the range in real time with all the different knobs and valves on this gun. So we are total nerds, yes. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I don't regret doing air gun videos for one minute and uh, I do plan on doing a heck of a lot more air gun videos and I had a chance uh, to sit down with Ted here and I really want to take the opportunity to introduce you guys to him because I wasn't sure if maybe some of you weren't familiar with his channel. Definitely check him out. He's a great dude um, and his videos are wildly entertaining and informative <laughs> And I really, really think highly of what you're doing. And I, and I think it's cool that you're one of the OGs in the air gun world. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me here today and show us some of your gear and talk about some of your methodology and um, you know some of your thought process for making videos, man. Oh, my pleasure, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yes. Oh, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Dude, so you have to go check out Ted's Holdover. And uh, are you anywhere else on social media, Instagram? No, I can't at all, man. I am only really? on YouTube. Only on YouTube. I am, I have, I have made a decision in my life to leave all that, and I'm still on YouTube. Very happy on YouTube, but I no longer uh, do all the social media stuff. It just That's ain't for me. Probably a good thing. <laughs> all right, so Ted's Holdover on YouTube. That's it. So go subscribe, check him out. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed today's video. And uh, we, we had a nice song, uh, a, a cacophony <laughs> of, uh, of goat, goat noises in the background throughout the video. We're, we're here uh, at, at undisclosed location in Tennessee, wink, wink. wink, wink. But uh, anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you had a great day and uh, enjoyed today's video. And we'll see you next time. Many more on the way.